after a break we resume today the final part of our book talk animal farm continues to be a favorite for all generations and with the rise in totalitarian regimes and fascist tendencies among various governments we realize that the book has gained renewed favor among readers. Today we shall look at the last six, five chapters. From chapter six to chapter 10, we'll do analysis and then we'll conclude with the themes. The last time we had stopped when Napoleon had unleashed the dogs that he had taken as puppies and they were now fully grown. He had unleashed them against his main rival, Snowball, forcing Snowball to flee. So in chapter six, there is a change in animal farm. Napoleon has become a supreme leader and the dogs are now the enforcers of his authority. In chapter six, life becomes very monotonous for the animals. They work hard and the pigs who are the leaders cut the ration that the animals are supposed to eat. Naturally, the animals complain, but then Squiller, the propagandist, comes in and says, look, we have not cut your food ration. We have only readjusted the food ration. And he reminds them that they are now working for their own good, and therefore they should be grateful. The animals continue to work, led by Boxer, who I described earlier, the powerful cart horse. He actually starts working three times harder. And the animals also have the commitment to rebuild the windmill. They have everything they need to build the windmill, but there are lots of other problems. The animals are struggling on how to break stones, Eventually, they decide to take the, the big stones into a quarry. They drop them from a height and then they are smashed into smaller pieces. At one point, the animals now have enough materials to build a windmill. This windmill is symbolic of the use of technology and general industrialization. They feel that they are not suffering more than they were suffering under Mr. Jones, but they are really still suffering. They have enough to eat, and since humans are no longer exploiting them, they have a level of contentment. But the farm still needs some certain things because the farm does not produce everything, particularly for a project like the windmill. They would need to buy things like iron, they would need to buy nails and other materials. So, because of that need, the Supreme Leader Napoleon one day announces that he had now hired a solicitor, a Mr. Wimper, to assist him to conduct trade. Remember one of the commandments said that no animal shall engage with trade or even any dealing with humans. Here is Napoleon who has now hired a human being to advise him on trade. The animals are wondering, this is a fundamental tenet of the revolution. 
Why would Napoleon do this? Once again, the chief propagandist Squiller comes in and explains that the founding principles of Animal Farm never at any time prohibited trade or the use of money. And then he says that if the animals think they have any such law, then they are probably still victims to lies and fabrications by the discredited snowball. Of course, the mention of Snowball's name on Animal Farm is prohibited. So any animal does not want to be associated with Snowball. Mr. Wimper starts visiting the farm every week. And Napoleon starts ordering things from him to supply. Napoleon and his clan of pigs start living in the farmhouse. Remember, one of the commandments was that no animal shall sleep in a house. The animals started hearing rumors that they are even sleeping in beds, which is a, a violation of one of the seven commandments. So one day, Clover asks Moriel to read which commandment. They found that the commandment which used to read that no animal shall sleep in a bed had been amended. It now read, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets. And Squilla explains that Clover must have forgotten the last two words. He insists that those were the original commandments. And he says all animals sleep in beds. He even goes ahead to explain that a pile of straw is actually a bed within the meaning of the seven commandments. And then he says that sheets, on the other hand, are an invention of human beings and they are actually a source of evil. He uses blackmail to ensure that the other animals agree. And he says that it is the pigs who are the brain workers. So they need to rest comfortably in order to think clearly for the farm for the greater good of all the other animals. As usual, he threatens that if they don't agree, Mr. Jones would come back. Around that time, a storm comes to the farm and it destroys a lot of the structures, it brings down roofs, knocks down even the flagpole and even one of the big trees. It was an M tree. The animals go and find that the windmill which they have been working so hard on had also been knocked down by the storm. Napoleon then calls a meeting and he announces in a very fearsome tone that the windmill had been knocked down by Snowball, the traitor. And he says Snowball is still plotting to do everything to destroy Animal Farm. He then issues what is called in Islam a fatwa. He announces a death sentence on Snowball and he says whoever manages to kill Snowball will receive a reward of a bushel of apples. And of course he gives a long speech to convince the animals that they should start work again to rebuild the windmill. And then he says, long live the windmill, long live animal farm. And of course the animals chorus that. Now, in understanding chapter 6, you must see that animal farm is not just one farm, but it is part of a network of many farms. This is a kind of analogy to an arena of politics. Politics 
is about interconnectedness of societies and states. So, in this chapter, and in particular by talking about animal farm and its connectedness with the other farms, Orwell is talking about Soviet Russia and the global circumstances under which it is struggled to prevail. We see that there are tactics that are being used by the ruling class to contain, dupe, and pacify the rest of the animals, who in this case we can call the working class. You can see how the rulers, the pigs, justify their luxurious lifestyle and the use of propaganda to cover up their failures. The windmill was poorly designed, poorly constructed. They needed to blame its collapse, not on a storm, which naturally a strong windmill would have resisted, but on a so-called traitor. So you have propaganda, lies, and scapegoatism as a technique for domination. These are all strategies that were implemented in Soviet Rus Russia. And any repressive government uses those techniques. By making that outrageous claim that Snowball was responsible for the collapse of the windmill, he's basically shifting blame away from himself. All governments enhance their standing and esteem by always creating what we call a boogeyman, an invisible conspiratorial enemy. And when compared with that kind of enemy, then their citizens would find that they can at least tolerate them. So, Repressive regimes always create an invisible enemy upon whose shoulders they heap all the blame. So that one is a smoke screen to cover their weaknesses. In this case, Snowball is actually Leon Trotsky. Now this is the Napoleon who we have already said his parallel is Joseph Stalin who succeeded Lenin as the leader of Russia after the revolution. It is a convenient means of governing, blame the enemy, cover up whatever you are doing wrong, and create an illusion of a threat, which usually is actually not real. The windmill is used to manipulate the ordinary animals. The animals break their back to construct the windmill. And in this case, they were forcing the animals to even work on Sundays. Remember, Sundays had been declared a holiday. The, the pigs threatened to withhold food if the animals don't work. And as you can see, the constant fear of being re-enslaved by humans is used to blackmail and hold the animals captive. It also makes the animals to tolerate whatever excesses. And this is also used as a justification for the privileges of the pigs. I hope those who have read this book know that the aim of George Orwell was to expose the cynical nature of dictatorship. The pigs gain power, they become corrupt, and yet the revolution was to fight human corruption. Eventually they become a personification, an embodiment of the very evils that the, the revolution was supposed to overturn. Naturally, those who have studied Soviet Russia know that Stalin and his officials started living in dachas. Dachas are 
luxurious homes on the Baltic Sea. They were basically living in the same luxurious condition like the Tsars that they had overthrown. And yet, these are the kind of so-called bourgeois lifestyles that they had condemned. So this is a parody. It is about exposing the cynicism that characterizes dictatorial regimes. Throughout the novel, the conduct of the pigs are actually indistinguishable from the conduct of Mr. Jones and the humans who they claim to have overthrown. In short, old Major's dream had been shattered. In this chapter that I'm analyzing, the pigs moved into the farmhouse. They start sleeping on the farmer's beds. So, when dictators are climbing and acquiring for themselves absolute power, they transform themselves into ruthless beings. They become selfish. They become power hungry. And oppression becomes the way of life. Let's go to chapter 7. In chapter 7, the animals are struggling to rebuild the windmill. And of course, the human beings don't believe that Snowball came and knocked down the windmill. They say that the walls were simply weak. But the animals don't agree. The animals believe Squilla, the propagandist. Because they are convinced that Snowball is a bigger enemy to the windmill project than any other natural cause like storms. So they now resolve that the wall must now be twice thicker than the previous one. Squilla, the propagandist, makes glorious speeches extolling the virtues of sacrifice. Many animals are inspired by these long speeches by Squilla, particularly Boxer, the powerful cut horse. He is really inspired and he works even harder than ever before. And the, but other animals are shocked. You remember in Old Major's manifesto or speech, he talked about exploitation of the animals by humans. And he talked about the cruelty of humans who sell the eggs that are laid by the hens. And the, the hens themselves, when they realized that their eggs were being sold, they rebelled. Napoleon reacted brutally by cutting their rations, denying them food. And because of the hens, remember in the book, the hens decided to drop their eggs from a high point and the eggs were simply shattered. So Napoleon unleashed the dogs on them and nine hens died. And this forced the other hens to give up on the, the defiance. Now the animals start hearing that Snowball had been visiting the farm. Again, this was propaganda. Napoleon says that he can see the presence of Snowball around the farm. So whenever anything goes wrong, Snowball is the scapegoat, is the one who is blamed. Another time they came and said Snowball had uh, sold himself to another farm. The farm owner was called Frederick. And uh, he, they even said that now Snowball was in partnership with Mr. Jones. And that even before the revolution, Snowball was actually, uh, what in Uganda you would now say, a moral, working for Mr. Jones. And he starts saying that even in the battle of the cowshed, 
Snowball actually was not fighting on the side of the animals, but fighting on the side of Mr. Jones and the, the humans. The animals are astonished, they are shocked. They remember Snowball as a hero. They even recall that Snowball had been given a, a medal. Boxer is puzzled. But of course, Napoleon and Squeal are convinced the other animals that the apparent bravery of Snowball was simply part of the plot. And they work hard to show that Napoleon, who had actually not played any significant role in that fight, the Battle of the Cowshed, I mean the Battle of the Windmill, they said that Napoleon actually fought more bravely than Snowball. And yet, the animals remember Snowball leading from the front. Squealer rewrites history. This is a major technique of dictators. So Squealer starts reinventing and recreating the battle scenes. Of course, the animals cannot remember much. All they can do is to believe. In this chapter, one of the pivotal events is when Napoleon convenes a meeting of all the animals. The nine dogs are of course around him, growling. So he starts an inquisition. He starts telling animals that are in cahoots or in conspiracy with Snowball to come and com confess. And uh, many animals come and confess and the dogs kill those animals. These are supposed to be traitors. The dogs even attack Boxer without anybody even accusing Boxer. Maybe they just didn't like him. Of course, Boxer is a powerful horse. So without any much effort, he just knocks them off. So, the, the dogs kill four pigs. Now, remember the pigs are the ruling class. So they are not also exempted from the ruthlessness of the dictator. Many animals alongside the four pigs are executed. Their throats are torn by the dogs. The hens also, who had rebelled against the proposal to sell their eggs, were also killed. Generally, there is bloodshed on the farm. And the bloodshed is contrary to the, the seven commandments because no animal is supposed to kill another animal. So, when Napoleon has left the rally, Boxer wonders whether this is still animal farm. But as usual, he's a simple-minded person and he justifies this situation and says, maybe the animals are at fault. Maybe they have done something wrong. As usual, he resolves to work even harder. Clover looks around the farm and he wonders how a revolution which was supposed to bring a fundamental change on the farm had degenerated to the kind of state that they were living in. When animals start singing their old revolutionary song, Beasts of England, Squealer, the propagandist, comes and says, no, Beasts of England should no longer be sung. It was only relevant during the rebellion and there's no more need for another rebellion. He tells the animals that now there is a new song which has been written by a pig known as Minimus. Minimus was a, a, a pig poet or a poet pig. And the, the new song is about patriotism and it glorifies animal farm. But it's not as inspirational as the beasts of England. Now, in order to understand this chapter, chapter 7, better, you must 
look at the relationship between the farm and the human beings. Humans still have contempt for the animals. They believe that they are superior. Just like during the Soviet Revolution, the other powers under NATO led by America and Western Europe, they challenged the industrial incompetence and backwardness, famine, poor management of the Soviet Empire. As you know, Stalin imposed the kind of revolution, agricultural revolution, based on collectivization. All farms were merged into big farms and the landowners were dispossessed. Far from increasing production, in the beginning this actually caused mass starvation. So this is, this is what the beginning of that chapter reveals to us. But the windmill is used by Napoleon as a prestige project. Naturally, dictators must have prestige projects. Some dictators build big dams as pre prestige projects. Other massive highways to boost the prestige of uh, the state and it is a way of showing the rest of the world that look we are also here and we are equal but this chapter is also very important because it emphasizes the use of violence which is now the main method of oppression and this oppression can be understood by the violence of the pigs led by Napoleon who now order the loyal dogs who are like a private army now. The purpose of this is to enforce obedience to ensure that everybody is meek and docile. In Russia there were various purges once in a while some leaders would be accused of being traitors to the regime. So, why did Orwell bring this analogy? Orwell did this because he wanted to show that dictators always want to have a monopoly on logic. Look at one of the examples. Animals shall not sleep in a bed and then they add with with sheets and then they even start equating straws grass with beds obviously the comfort of uh, of mattresses and blankets cannot be compared to the the straws the rough straws that the other animals were sleeping in so the rulers, in this case the pigs, claim a monopoly on logic. They claim a monopoly over all the resources. While the majority of the people who they claim to have liberated are suffering, they are hungry and deprived. Owell also wanted to contrast the extreme luxury that the pigs lived in and the conditions of deprivation that the other animals lived in. The other theme in this chapter is how Napoleon is trans transforms his nemesis, Snowball, into a caricature and then keeps the blame for everything that went wrong on him. As we go to the next chapter, let us conclude chapter 7 by commenting more about how dictators rewrite history. They don't just rewrite it, they rewrite it so that it favors them. They claim credit for every positive development. 
whatever has been good on the farm is attributed to the dictator. Everything bad is blamed on the enemy, on the enemies. They also use the platform they have to tell lies. For instance, they tell the animals that now you live longer. They tell the animals that now you are producing more. They tell the animals that now you are working fewer hours and so on and so forth. In other words, through propaganda, dictators distort reality. A dictator can even tell you that no, you have actually gained weight and you start believing that you have gained weight yet you may be thinner. Why do people acquiesce to that falsification of reality? They acquiesce because of fear and propaganda. So, this acquiescence is actually a survival mechanism. So you have to, even if you don't believe what the dictator is saying, you have to pretend to be believing for the sake of preserving your life. So it is a survival mechanism. I don't think all the animals believed all the rubbish that was being said by the pigs, but they pretended to believe. Let's go to chapter 8. In chapter 8, it is a, a day after the executions. And then the animals discovered that one of the commandments had changed. There was a commandment which used to read, no animal shall kill any other animal. But now it had, it had been transformed to read, no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. And the animals start blaming themselves for not remembering the commandments accurately. They work very hard to remember, but they, they discover that actually, maybe it is their fault. They can no longer remember that actually it was an absolute change. Two complete meanings. So, Squiller, as usual, comes and starts giving false statistics to show that the conditions of the animals are much, much, much better than they were under Mr. Jones. And he vows that the conditions will continue improving. So, Napoleon now stops just being a comrade because those days he was comrade Napoleon, basically first among equals. In this chapter 8, Napoleon now assumes the title. He's now called leader. And he has a lot of other honors conferred upon him. The, the poet Pig has written a poem. All of it is about praising Napoleon. And it is now on the wall. And the... Uh, Timber, which had been abandoned by Mr. Jones, is sold. And yet, the man who bought the timber, Mr. Pilkington, was supposed to be a most hated person by all the animals. But now, he's the one who comes to buy the timber. And yet, Previously, there was a lot of propaganda against Mr. Frederick. And then Napoleon had even said that the new slogan to show their hatred for humans should be death to Frederick. Unfortunately, this same Frederick eventually comes and buys the timber. Because it is Frederick and Pilkington who had ownership of the neighboring farms. The pigs, as usual, are there to defend Napoleon. And they talk about Napoleon as a genius who has managed
to coax the humans to come and buy the timber. And they even concoct some silly logic and they said, you know, the pigs were offered a check, but instead of accepting the check, they demanded cash. So that's a sign of how clever Napoleon is because he could not allow to be given a mere piece of paper. And of course he takes the, the notes, the bank notes and he keeps them. In this chapter, the windmill is also now completed. Remember, thanks to Boxer, the windmill is having double thickness on the wall. Now, unfortunately, before they start even thinking of what to do, Napoleon discovers that the cash which he had received from Mr. Frederick was actually fake money. He gets very, very, very annoyed. He tells the animals that they should prepare for the worst. Unfortunately, around the same time, Mr. Frederick, who is supposed to be a trading partner of Napoleon, storms the farm with armed men to try and overrun the, the farm. The animals are afraid because Frederick and his men start planting explosives, dynamite. They put explosives at the base of the windmill before they have even used it for one minute. And they blow up the windmill. The animals are provoked. They attack the invaders, chase them away. But the cost was very, very high. Many animals were killed, and even Boxer was very seriously injured. The morale of the animals becomes lower. What does Napoleon do? He organizes a flag raising ceremony to cheer up the animals in order to restore their faith in animal farm. Now, in the same chapter, there's an event where the, the pigs discover some whiskey in the farmhouse. Apparently, Mr. Jones, who used to enjoy his drink, had left a crate of whiskey in the farmhouse. At night, the animals are woken up and they are hearing singing and a lot of noise from inside the, the farmhouse. And then they hear exchanges. Apparently, there is a quarrel. Obviously, the pigs had been drinking the whole night. In the morning, the pigs definitely have a hangover. Some of them look sick. And there's even a rumor that Comrade Napoleon may be dying. But by the evening, he had recovered. I think it was just a severe hangover. And they also found Squealer. Squealer had also been drinking, of course. They found him, he had fallen, he had been trying to climb the wall near the barn. Apparently he was trying to, to write some things, to add certain things to the commandments. So he had fallen and the, the ladder was, was leaning on the wall and there was a paintbrush near him. The animals, of course, this time begin to understand what is going on. And then they see that one of the commandments had actually been changed. The one alcohol. Remember, one of the seventh commandments was no animal shall drink alcohol. This time, Squilla had amended it obviously in the instruction of Napoleon and the new commandment read no animal shall drink alcohol to excess usually the animals blame their poor memories they believe that this had been the original commandment 
but maybe they are just forgotten. Let's quickly look at uh, the perversion of the truth by dictators. Napoleon and Squilla systematically distort the truth. They practice what we call duplicity. They are chameleons. They, they, they are double-faced. In those who have read Karl Marx know that he had talked about a dictatorship of the proletariat. And dictatorship of the proletariat meant that democratic freedoms would not be the most important thing in the system, but rather it would be number two. What matters most in the socialist revolution, according to Karl Marx, is to stamp out any resistance by the class that has been overthrown. In other words, more effort is put in dealing with so-called counter-revolutionaries than in giving freedom to those who have been liberated. So, this theory was abused by Stalin and his cronies. This was their main justification for the violence and totalitarianism that they imposed on Russia. For instance, those who know about Russia remember that his, Stalin's government distorted the idea of equal work for equal pay. And they, they distorted it in order to reward those who were militarily and politically connected. Government was based on manipulation. In Russia, there was never any popular revolt among the working class. Because of these techniques of repression, the animals also show no sign of rebellion. The poet, the pig poet Minimus, works very, very hard to continue extolling the virtues of Napoleon. Of course, the poems are useless. They, they talk about full bellies, clean straws, and so on. That kind of empty praise actually is empty because it does not reflect the actual reality on the ground. By describing in detail the hypocritical conduct of Napoleon in dealing with the human beings, for instance, through, through trade, George Orwell is trying to parody Stalin's diplomatic maneuvers with the, some of the Western countries, like Germany, and some of the allied forces, especially around the time of World War II. You can find more by reading the history of the Soviet Union. Now the pigs, they use the heroism of certain individuals from the oppressed classes in order to, to instill patriotism. For instance, an oppressor will identify somebody from among the oppressed and turn them into a poster boy for patriotism. This is intended to soothe the feelings of those who are oppressed so that they start feeling that they are also part of the system. So, Napoleon does this through the flag raising ceremony, the award of medals, and the state now becomes the fountain of glory. And far from ennobling the individuals, this, this kind of actions actually ennoble the state. They do not glorify the individual. 
they actually glorify the state and they make the state to look as if it is grateful, it is glorious and gracious. There are many, many parallels. Those who have read the, the last novel that George Orwell wrote, 1984, will find that actually there are many things in Animal Farm. And the truth is, the oppressed always have to apologize for their suffering. So they always have to be saying the government is trying its best, but the government is being undermined by wrong elements. Let's look at the second last chapter before we conclude with an analysis of the themes. In chapter 9, the animals are working at rebuilding the windmill again. Boxer is injured, but despite the pain, he does not miss work even for one day. And he is given some consolation by his friend Clover. No animal has to miss work. No animal has even retired. And Boxer looks forward to retirement. He says before he retires, they must finish the windmill. Boxer, of course, is about to reach the retirement age. And remember, on Animal Farm, retirement age had been set at 12. So any animal that reached the age of 12 was entitled to retirement. And Boxer looks forward to living in the pasture as a retired worker. But the animals find that they are eating less, food is scarce, the food rations are reduced. For everyone except for the pigs and the dogs. In this case, except for the rulers and the security apparatus. <coughs> Excuse me. But in order to soothe the animals, Squealer, as usual, has ready-made propaganda, spewing out statistics and lies, talking about readjustment, not reduction of the rations. And of course, he tells them that they are eating more than they used to eat during the days of Mr. Jones. And he also says that when the pigs and dogs get good food, everybody else benefits, even those who don't eat. After all, it is for the good of animal farm, and it is the only way they can prevent Mr. Jones and the humans from coming back. Now, Napoleon takes over some little pigs. In this chapter, four souls give birth to Napoleon's piglets. Now, this is a new generation. You could say Napoleon had four wives and they give him little piglets. There were a total of 31. So naturally, Napoleon commands that a school should be built for his children. And uh, you should know that the farm has no funds, but Napoleon is extending his privileges to his offsprings. He starts ordering certain special events. These events are called spontaneous demonstrations. So the animals are supposed to carry out spontaneous demonstrations, march around the farm, listen to speeches and exult in the glory of their new condition. 
other animals start questioning these so-called spontaneous because they are not spontaneous they are forced to deal with this resistance the pigs coach the sheep on the farm to always drown out any voices of dissent so whenever other animals are resisting these events of marching around the farm listening to endless speeches the sheep would start bleating four legs good two legs bad four legs good two legs bad and everybody else would be heckled into silence in this chapter there's also a change remember napoleon has now moved from comrade to leader in this chapter animal farm is declared a republic and by a unanimous vote because napoleon was a sole candidate he becomes president and on that same day when napoleon assumes the title of president they also tell the animals that snowball had actually plotted with the attackers who came and blew up the windmill that he plotted with the attackers who fought them at the battle of the cowshed and that snowball was actually seen in person with the human beings and that he had even let out a cry saying long live humanity so in this chapter you remember moses the rabbi he returns to the farm and starts talking about his so called sugar candy mountain moses actually represents the russian orthodox church in this novella those who are telling the workers to suffer quietly because there's a better world after after the earthly life the pigs work very hard to denounce moses is evangelizing but they still allow moses to stay on the farm and he doesn't have to work this also shows how dictators can tolerate religious groups that serve them and that dictatorial regimes can also underwrite the expenses of religious groups so that they can keep the people calm and to accept that their condition on earth is god's will and that it is a preparation for a better world after this one in this chapter actually one of the saddest episodes is when boxer realizes that really his energy is failing him he's getting weaker and weaker and he collapses while working hard on the windmill the other animals go and tell squilla that boxer had collapsed and the the other animals benjamin the donkey and clover they stay near boxer so the pigs tell the animals that they are going to take boxer to a human hospital to recover when the cart arrives benjamin the donkey that was intelligent you know alia had told you that benjamin represents the intelligentsia intellectuals who know what to do but they don't do it they are basically like spectators they don't want to engage with the situation in order to change it so the animals think that boxer is being taken to a hospital for treatment in reality boxer is being taken to be slaughtered and benjamin reads the writings on the cart and it announces that it is going to a company of glue makers and horse slaughterers the animals panic and they start telling boxer to kick the door of the cart to come out he tries his best to kick from inside but he is not strong enough 
is unable to get out. Boxer is taken, slaughtered, and sold off. Soon Squealer comes again to dupe the animals and he tells them that unfortunately, despite all the efforts to treat him, Boxer was not cured and he died at the hospital. And he even announces to the animals that he was there when Boxer was dying and he says that was the most moving sight he had ever seen. And he even says Boxer died praising the glories of Animal Farm. And he is shamelessly denouncing those who know the truth that Boxer had been taken to horse slaughterers and glue makers. And he says that those who say Boxer was taken to a glue factory are spreading lies. He even goes ahead to deceive the animals that that cat used to belong to a glue maker. The hospital had bought it, but they had not yet painted their real name of the hospital on the cat. The animals, gullible as they are, they are relieved. And Napoleon gives a speech praising Boxer, and the animals accept it that Boxer actually has not been sold to glue makers, but rather had died in a hospital. This is no normal. They say revolutions eat their own children. Boxer was the highest person in that farm. What reward did he get? He was disposed of, again for profit. So the oppressed are exploited when they are alive. They are also exploited when they are dead. And uh, after this speech by Napoleon, a cat comes and delivers some goods to the farm. And at night, the animals again hear celebration in the farmhouse. It must have been booze no alcohol. So, obviously the pigs had found money to buy another crate of whiskey. Nobody asked where they could have found the money. But if the animals had the ability to put two and two together, they would have known that, well, Boxer was sold and the money has been used to buy drink to entertain the ruling class, the pigs. So, in this chapter, the style of leadership by the pigs is based on hypocrisy and treachery. They are double-faced. What you see is not what you get. And they are treacherous. They are not loyal to any principle. They are not loyal to anybody. Because by selling boxer for profit, the pigs are acting exactly like the humans that they had overthrown. So, this is exploitation of the highest order. Now, why did Orwell recreate this powerful scene? Orwell did this to he used Boxer's life of total commitment to a cause and his death as a, a microcosm of how dictatorships treat the working class that they purport to serve. Now, the dictatorship exploits you and then they ruthlessly dispose of you. You are discarded. Now, Napoleon, in order to soothe the feelings of the animals, allows Moses back. Remember, Moses, the raven that preached about Sugar Candy Mountain, 
in this case heaven, had gone away. But he came back. So Napoleon now brings him back and of course starts talking about how Boxer has now gone to Sugar Candy Mountain and the animals start feeling good again. And with Moses as a collaborator of the oppressive regime, the oppression is now more ripe than ever. Moses' message of a sugar candy mountain which people, which animals go to after they die demoralizes the animals and kills any spirit of rebellion that may be fermenting. The animals feel that they must rebel but a combination of the summons by Moses, the spontaneous demonstrations, flag raising, this is normal. In ancient Rome, the dictatorial emperors built the Colosseum. So the people were frequently entertained. They therefore had no time to even reflect on their true conditions as a way of getting a new consciousness in order to start fighting against their chains. This is very, very, very ironical because ultimately whatever happened in the Colosseum was hollow and whatever happens in the flag raising ceremony is actually hollow. So when you look at the resources that are used for those kind of ceremonies, so the rest of the animals simply go along to be part of the, the circus or charade. Let's go to the last chapter, chapter 10. By this time, many years have passed. Many of the animals had already died. Others were very old. Very few actually recall the days before the revolution. Mr. Jones is a very distant memory. And the new windmill is completed, of course. The animals thought the windmill would generate electricity so that they'd have more hours of daylight. But instead, the windmill is being used for milling corn or maize, which is considered to be more profitable than providing light to the animals. The farm is, on the face of it, prosperous. It has money. But the ordinary animals don't benefit from it. The pigs are many, the dogs are many, and they live in utter luxury. As usual, Squilla explains that the pigs and dogs do most of the work and they are responsible for the stability and peace on the farm. And animals are supposed to feel a sense of pride an animal farm and they tell other animals on other farms that for them they run their own affairs they are indeed free they are liberated because they are no human beings and yet the conduct of the pigs was exactly the conduct of the oppressive human beings one day in this last chapter Squilla took the sheep to teach them a new, a new chant. This is similar to taking them to a political education course. In the case of Uganda, you can call it a kind of chankwanzi. So the animals have finished their work, they have returned, and the sheep are now back, having gone for a course at their Changkwanzi. Now, the pigs do something which shocked the animals. Napoleon appears and is walking upright. He's walking on two legs. And what is he carrying? A whip. 
the animals are shocked. But before they are even capable of reacting and expressing their shock, the sheep who had been taken by Squilla for training in a new chant burst out saying, four legs good, two legs better. Four legs good, two legs better. Four legs good, two legs better. Remember, previously it was four legs good, two legs bad. Now it is four legs good, two legs better. And Clover, the horse, her eyes are failing, so he asks Benjamin, the intelligent donkey, to read something on the wall where the seven commandments had been written. And they discovered that all the other commandments had been rubbed. There was now only the last commandment. But it was no longer reading exactly like they could remember. Remember the last commandment was all animals are equal. All animals are equal. But this time it had a proviso, an addition. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. So it was a totally new commandment. They had added, but some animals are more equal than others. In other words, the key tenet of the revolution had now been destroyed. Inequality was now the new normal. The following days, apart from holding a whip, walking on two legs, Napoleon now starts even smoking a pipe. The way the animals used to do. And the, the pigs who know how to read even start subscribing to magazines published by human beings. They start listening to the radio. They even install a telephone. And they had raided Mr. John's wardrobe, so the pigs started wearing even clothes. Remember, from seven commandments, only one now remained. All the others had been reduced to one. All animals are equal, but some other animals are more equal than others. One day, the pigs now, really showing their true colors, invite their neighbors, the human beings. They ask them to come and tour animal farm. To their surprise, the animals who used to think that humans and animals should be colliding are shocked that the humans are praising the pigs. And they start saying they regret past misunderstandings between the humans and the animals. The animals are watching through a window when the leader of the humans Mr. Pilkington and Napoleon are having a drink and even toasting, telling each other cheers. And one of the saddest statements which I should read here, Mr. Pilkington says that they also have their problems as humans, the way the animals also have their problems. And he says, if you have your lower animals to contend with, we have our lower classes. In other words, inequality is accepted and enforced. The dream of the classless society where everybody is equal is shattered. And the whip is now a symbol of forcing the animals to work harder. And Pilkington thanks the pigs for finding techniques to extract more hours of work 
from the animals. And the pigs, of course, led by Napoleon, assure the humans that all they want is peaceful coexistence. And they say that the, the animals will no longer address each other with the title of comrade. And there will even be no more paying tribute to old major. And they will now salute Napoleon's image rather than the flag which had a horn and a hoof. In other words, everything had been changed. The animal flag was now cast away. And no reason had been given by the animals. Napoleon now even changes the name of Animal Farm and he says it will go back to its old name of Mana Farm. And he describes it as the correct and original name. The pigs and farmers continue playing cards, they are smoking, and the animals are shocked. Soon, the animals hear a lot of grumbling, noise. Apparently, a quarrel had broken up Napoleon and Pilkington appeared to have been cheating each other at a game of cards. Each of them had thrown master spades on the table. And Napoleon tells Mr. Pilkington, how can you have a master of spades? And I also have a master of, master of spades. And now they don't know who actually is cheating because the cards are the same. So each one is accusing the other of cheating. They are watching from the window. Napoleon is dressed in a suit and a tie with a cigar in his mouth. And the last chapter shows the animals puzzled, turning their eyes from pig to man, from man to pig, and they can't tell the difference. In short, the revolution has moved full circle. They had gone back to where they had begun. Let me comment briefly on the meaning of this very important chapter. It is the logical conclusion of George Orwell's lifelong struggle against abuse of power. Power is good, but power can be abused. Animal Farm is about abuse of power and the mechanisms, tools, and techniques that are used by those who abuse power to prevent their victims from rising up. The techniques for consolidation of power is made clear and the pigs overwhelm any tendency to achieve the ideals of animal farm. In this chapter, which shows the fuss that animal farm had become, the pigs and animals can no longer be distinguished. Now, George Orwell could have just written an article or, his, or, or a book which is non-fiction, but in the tradition of Aesop, he used this animal fable to tell the story from the point of view of the animals. We see that this is a very, very powerful technique. One thing you observe is that the animals don't lose hope. Up to the end, the animals are hopeful. They think that the dream of old major will be achieved and they keep saying, someday the dream will be achieved. But at the end we see the supreme irony of mana farm becoming animal farm and becoming mana farm again. Now, the faith 
in animal farm begins to collapse of course you have the gap now between the idealism and optimism of the animals and the harsh reality eventually all revolutions need a mirror to be put before them so that they can see the gap between the harsh reality and the ideals that were promised but never fulfilled the totalitarianism and dictatorship and tyranny by the pigs is contrasted with the ideals that were captured in old major's dream george orwell also wanted to show that states don't descend into dictatorship suddenly it is always gradual i've said before that dictators behave like a person who wants to boil a frog if you want to boil a frog you don't drop it in hot water you put the frog in cold water and then light a fire under the pot the frog will start sensing changes in temperature but before it realizes in time to escape the water will be boiling so descent into tyranny is always gradual that's what these 10 chapters show to us and the terror of betrayal is more dramatic when you see the pigs on two legs we have seen in our own uganda when the nrm came into power they said we will never import import furniture the old regime was castigated for importing spanish chairs but if you go to state house it will be very hard to find any furniture made in uganda though there is rhetoric of using uganda prisons it was nissan laurel which was the vehicle for ministers they were modestly priced now we see the v8 fuel gasolers for which the taxpayers have to pay so these are all symbols of betrayal if you want to change a society and you denounce the decadence of the old society you want to change then you should not degenerate into practicing the same decadence that inspired the revolution in the first place i think there is nothing more powerful in the book to demonstrate betrayal than when the animals saw the pigs walking on two legs but like all dictatorships the pigs had prepared themselves to deal with any resistance they found the gallibo ship took them away coached them to come and start chanting four legs good two legs better to show that this is the new idea so the animals were brainwashed and also carrying a whip by napoleon is also a sign of betrayal so as we close our analysis we are disturbed that in the last scene the pigs and the animals cannot be distinguished one from the other they see that the animals have lost power actually the animals thought they owned animal farm but from the last scene it is clear that they are no longer having any entitlement to anything whatever they got was a ration from the pigs and they were completely powerless so something which was supposed to bring about equality just 
brought a new class of oppressors to continue the system of domination. In other words, the theme of domination runs all through this. Now, when the seven commandments are now distilled into only one, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. George Orwell wanted to use the story of how the seven commandments kept changing to show how dictators manipulate language and it becomes an instrument of control. Nobody thought that any other animal would be more equal. But after years of hunger and violence and fear, the idea of equality now appears to have been relegated to the past. The animals are adjusting to their new condition where they even have to accept inequality. The animals lack dignity. There's no social justice. And there's total powerlessness. Because without power, you cannot claim rights. This is what George Orwell wanted to communicate. So by the pigs and the dogs claiming to be more equal, which is actually a nonsensical concept, because all human beings are created equal. In fact, all constitutions proclaim that all humans are equal. So George Orwell wanted to show the grave distortion that Animal Farm represented. And he presents us with a picture where the so-called liberators are now standing in the same shoes of the old masters that apparently they had overthrown. Let's take a few minutes to look at the themes before we end this book discussion. I, I hope all of you who are watching have enjoyed reading this book with me. Those who want a soft copy to be emailed to you. Just send me an email. I put that email before. Send an email to askmao2021 at gmail.com askmao2021 at gmail.com All small letters, all lowercase. I'll be happy to send you a soft copy. And if you're interested in things fall apart, I'll also be able to send it to you. So the first theme is really the corruption of ideals. And when I was a young man in secondary school, when I first read this book, I found that this was a critique of so-called revolutions, particularly the Russian Revolution and how a small clique hijacks a popular cause, a popular cause, and they assume powers that are actually supposed to be vested in the majority of the people. It shows how a ruling class can emerge out of equals. We also see a struggle for prominence by children of the revolution. In Russia, it was between Stalin and Trotsky, Leon. In many societies, you always see a dictator and a nemesis. That is what George Orwell wanted to critique. This is a historical novel, you could even say, except that it uses animals as the characters. Usually the more powerful figure through deviousness and scheming, in this case Napoleon, throws out the one who is more sincere, like Snowball, 
So Snowball represents Leon Trotsky. Napoleon represents Stalin. Purges are used to get rid of potential rivals and uh, imaginary rivals. Now, the pigs become violent, yet their commandment had required that there should be no killing. They adopt human traits and start having all the trappings of the oppressor's lifestyle. That is why the first theme that comes clearly in this book is the corruption of uh, ideals. Of course, overthrowing a dictator is an achievement. We can't deny it. But it becomes ironical when those who overthrow a dictator also become dictatorial. So George Orwell wanted to indict those who corrupt a good idea. They corrupt language, they corrupt ideologies, they corrupt ideas, they corrupt laws, and they preside over a disintegration or a perversion of idealism. So there is violence of language and also physical, physical violence. This is a book that criticizes the excesses of the Stalinist Russian regime. And it talks about how that system offended logic, language, and ideals. The second theme is that George Orwell, ever cynical, was trying to show that societies tend to stratify themselves. In other words, even where there is no class, there are tendencies for classes to stratify themselves. So, even where people assume that they are equal, human beings tend to, to re-establish levels of power. They create a kind of pyramid of power, even where none should exist. So, all societies that allege that they are equal always have a few who are more equal than others. And classes can be unified if there is a common enemy. And the time when the animals were all against humans, they were united because they felt that they had a common enemy who needs to be eliminated. But according to George Orwell, when an oppressor and an oppressive figure is expelled, there is a power vacuum. And that vacuum has to be filled. So the expulsion of Mr. Jones created a power vacuum and the pigs promptly consolidated themselves and occupied that power vacuum. They start calling themselves brain workers and they use their superior knowledge and intelligence to manipulate the rest of the society. I wish I would have a chance to interview George Orwell. I would ask him, is this an inherent aspect in our society? Is it an inherently human thing? Or does it depend on, on the integrity of uh, the, what you would call the, the intelligentsia. Because you can see that in this novel, Benjamin, intelligent, he knows what is going on, but just goes along. 
So, why would a small group consolidate power and oppress the majority? Unless those who are conscious enough to understand what is going on remain vigilant. So, the lack of vigilance by the intelligentsia contributes to the consolidation of power in the hands of dictators. I'm just assuming that that is how George Orwell would argue, because I would want him to tell me whether it is just inherent in the society or not. So, the point is, no matter the explanation, it is a threat to democracy and freedom. The third theme that one can find is the naivety or gullibility. You can call it dangerous gullibility of the ordinary people. In Uganda here, they will say, Kastatu eva kakutulo. At least we are sleeping. We may be hungry. We may not have access to quality health care. Our children may not be going to school. We may be poor. But at least we can sleep at night. Freedom cannot be based on a trade-off. Freedom must always be expanding. So, through Animal Farm, it is not just the dictators who are critiqued. It is not just the oppressor who is critiqued. Even the oppressed are critiqued and exposed. It takes two to duck to tango. A manipulative, violent, and deceptive oppressor needs an acquiescent and compliant population of the oppressed. So, occasionally, George Orwell starts telling the stories of the farm through ordinary especially those who are hardworking, loyal, and gullible. Even in Uganda, many times you hear some of those who have now parted ways with the regime saying, I have been used. So, analyzing a dictatorship requires critiquing not only the dictator, but also the dictator's victims and how a system can betray the ideals on which it is supposed to be founded. Most of the oppressed actually have a dilemma because of propaganda and the fear of things getting worse, they begin to believe that the status quo is actually better than anything that they could ever have. And most of the ordinary oppressed people don't like complicated things. And they are represented powerfully by George Orwell in the character of Boxer, who says, Napoleon is always right, I will work harder. Napoleon is always right, I will work harder. Even when they should know better. So, this inability and unwillingness to question power actually contributes to repression. And uh, the last theme, there are many smaller themes, but I just thought I should talk about the main ones, is how language is used to abuse power. You know, in Uganda, the most famous example is when President Museveni said Africa's greatest problem is leaders who claim to power. I hope people have noticed that now it has changed to Africa's greatest problem is that of leaders who claim to power without elections. That of course begs the question, what kind of elections? What quality of elections? So. You now have all animals are equal. 
become all animals are equal and others are more equal. No animals shall sleep in a bed. Two, no animals shall sleep in a bed with the sheets. And so on and so on and so forth. So the abuse of language in the consolidation of absolute power is a major thing and that is enacted on the wall of the barn where Squilla promptly, promptly amends the commandments and the deluded animals can't remember whether it is the way it was in the beginning or it is an amendment. So, this twisting and distortion of truth, the use of rhetoric is intended to justify the abuse of power. But more importantly, it is supposed to keep the animals in the dark. In other words, the animals are not thinking about their true condition. They are always being bombarded with memories of the bad days when Mr. Jones was the lord of the farm to the extent that they think they are having it too good. So, opposing the oppressor now becomes one and the same with opposing the ideals of the revolution. In other words, when you question the leader's treachery, you are presented as a traitor yourself because the leader represents the revolution. So opposing the status quo, however oppressive, is now presented as opposing the ideals of the revolution. So everything now becomes accepted. What would have been criminal stops being criminal. So Squilla actually now sanctions through his amendments of the of the commandments treachery. Treachery now becomes to all the animals. My last word. There are some words like equality. Now, when you are talking about equality, you cannot again put equality and inequality in the same sentence. This is how blunt oppression can be. If you want to understand better what George Orwell was trying to do, read his article on language and politics. So, the abuse of language is a very important feature of animal farm and uh, it is worthy of very, very close study because those words with distorted meanings or words that lose meaning eventually become the prison walls in a dictatorship. I want to thank all of you who have been following this book from the beginning. I'm very grateful. It has been an honor sharing with you my thoughts. I first read this book when I was in senior one. I read it still occasionally. The book talks will continue. They may be sporadic, but we shall be announcing them. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.